tonight, the world's attention is absolutely fixed on Iraq. We only see a slice of the whole battlefield on television where there are cameras, specifically Baghdad today. But this was a violent representation of what is happening in many places. The U.S. fired 600 cruise missiles at Iraq today, $600 million worth of technology. The British fired some too. The United States flew 1,500 missions today, 700 of which were bombing raids. On the ground, U.S. and British forces pushed into Iraq from the south. There was some resistance. U.S. forces were held up at times. But based on official U.S. sources and reporters in the field, they are moving steadily toward Baghdad. Two Marines have died in combat today, one of them in the battle for Umm Qasr, the southern port, Another as Marines rush to take over an oil installation in the south. In the town of Safwan today, once the U.S. had arrived, the locals tore down a poster of Saddam Hussein. Hundreds of thousands of posters to go. We're told that Iraqi troops are surrendering in considerable number, and today the first commander of an Iraqi division surrendered. Saddam Hussein, seen on television today with his younger son and two officers, a smaller gathering than usual whenever that videotape was made. The CIA now believes that Saddam Hussein survived the attack on Wednesday night. The Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, he didn't know much more than that, but he said so that the Iraqis could clearly hear that he thinks the regime is losing control of the country. We're going to begin, of course, at the Pentagon with our Pentagon correspondent who works 24 hours a day, ABC's John McCrethy. John? Peter, as you say, this was a day of dramatic changes in the air war and on the ground. And for a few hours tonight in the Iraqi capital, the U.S. gave the regime its first taste of a strategy called shock and awe. Downtown Baghdad lit up in explosions and balls of fire. Hundreds of bombs and cruise missiles ripping into Saddam Hussein's palaces, into the headquarters of his secret police and his security structure. On this one day, sources say the U.S. used more than 1,500 bombs and cruise missiles throughout the country. The goal, cut off the regime's ability to communicate with its military and cripple the military's ability to fight. It was intended to be another body blow, one of many now being delivered by the U.S.-led coalition to a regime that Defense Secretary Rumsfeld claimed was starting to crumble. The regime is starting to lose control of their country. Their ability to see what is happening on the battlefield, to communicate with their forces, and to control their country is slipping away. In a bizarre effort to prove just the opposite, the Iraqi Minister of Defense held a press briefing this evening during the worst of the bombing, bravely pretending to ignore the explosions outside that shook his maps. As the bombs fell on Baghdad, the coalition ground defensive made sweeping changes in the map of who controls the country. We have had an incredible 24 hours of success unlike anything I've ever experienced in my career. First, the South. More than 60,000 troops moved across the border with Kuwait, the force so massive it took 25 hours just to roll its 20,000 tanks, trucks, and armored personnel carriers into Iraqi territory. By day's end, lead elements of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division and the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force were more than 100 miles up the road toward Baghdad. Meanwhile, U.S. and British forces went after the key Iraqi port of Umm Qasr, fighting for nearly a day before the American flag was raised in triumph. This harbor will now become a main resupply port for cargo heading north. The fight for Basra, another major port and the second largest city in Iraq, raged for most of the night. But sources say the commander of the Iraqi division defending Basra and his top deputy have surrendered, the first division commander to do so. Also of major importance, all major oil fields in the south are now under coalition control. In the west, U.S. and British commandos in a huge parachute operation seized two crucial airfields in the desert. The largest, called H-3, is to become America's main base in the West. Through it and a second base captured later in the day, the U.S. plans to pump thousands of troops that will eventually pressure Baghdad on the West. 
in the north. Sources say U.S. Special Operations Forces took over one airfield in Kurdish-controlled territory, then seized a second near Erbil. That force will eventually press Baghdad from the north. Another important part of its mission is to gain control of Iraq's rich northern oil fields, where Iraqi forces had begun to torch some of the wells. They do not as yet have full control. While taking control of territory is part of the goal, influencing world opinion of how this war is perceived is also considered crucial for success. I doubt that, that in a conflict of this type there's ever been the degree of free press coverage uh, as you are witnessing in this instance. And that coverage is now not only showing the bombing of Baghdad, but also the wholesale surrender of Iraqi units. And as U.S. troops pushed through southern Iraq, there were the first images that answered the question, at least in one small village, of whether U.S. troops would be welcomed as liberators or invaders. But today there was also a warning. Baghdad, the heart of Saddam Hussein's power base, still lay ahead. As you've seen from the TV coverage from embedded, embedded media, clearly we're moving towards our objectives. But we must not get too comfortable. The administration says it is negotiating with a number of top officials within the Iraqi military. The problem here is that none of the officials they are negotiating with, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld acknowledges, command units in Baghdad, and that's where the trouble will lay, Peter. Many thanks, John.